Sometimes when you talk about ancient cultures, it's difficult because blue and green, if you look at the color wheel, since we're going there, blue and green are very close. We would all call this one blue. We would all call this one green. The problem with ancient languages is this. So anything in between, a bit of, a, of the teal, and then all of the different in-betweens when like it's blue, but it's getting towards green. The place where you put a line and say it stops being blue and it becomes green after you cross this, it's different in so many cultures that it's why translating other languages can become problematic when you're like, okay, but to you, is this a blue or is it a green? It happens in Chinese, it happens in Old Norse, it happens in African languages. It's a fascinating thing. I absolutely love how colors work within the realm of translation. This, in fact, it's an even better example. Where do you draw the line is cultural and it's a construct. As I proved before with blue, but I'm gonna prove it now again with orange. Orange in English as a distinct color is also a recent origin and it's relatively rare in languages. Chaucer described the color of a fox fur as, open quotes, betwixt yellow and red. He didn't have a word for it, but he could clearly see it. Peter Gainsford says people are misinterpreting the ancient Greek color words and the terms kianios and glaukos cover most of the color space denoted as blue in English. It's not that the ancient Greeks didn't have a word for blue, it's just that the ancient Greek words in question cover several colors that include blue. Athena's eyes is a great example of this. At the very beginning of the Iliad, Athena's eyes could range from green to blue to perhaps even shiny silverly. The ancient Greeks had words for the different shades of blue. They just did not seem to use one collective term for all varieties of blue. From the prehistoric times to our time, color information was interpreted first by our brains through our eyes and second by our linguistic systems through our cultures. The gradual transition from the prehistorical general consciousness to the scientific knowledge of the nature of color phenomena is complex, but one thing is for sure. The relationship of mankind to the color world is not just utilitarian. We don't just represent linguistically each color as we actually see it all the time. Color, in language, is not just about description, but also categorization. After reading ancient writers' description of the sea being dark wine colored, stormy, but never blue, honey being described as green, sure you might think the ancients were weird, why wouldn't you just describe something with its actual color? We do it too. Let me prove it to you. And we describe this wine as white. This is white wine. This is yellow mate. Now imagine if I opened a bottle of white wine and instead of looking like this, it looked like this. I would not drink it. Different languages categorize color differently. Even though most humans perceive the same differences between colors, in linguistics, the exchange of descriptive colors for different basic ones is called type modification, and it's extremely common in most languages. When you use a type modification system, you use a more basic color term in order to classify things rather than describing them. We do it too, on a daily basis, and saying green honey is weird but white grapes is not, is a double standard. Nothing weird under the sun. And talking about the sun, the sun in Old Norse and other Old Germanic and Slavic languages is considered red, roder, and so is gold. And no, gold did not have a high copper content, if that's what you're wondering. Only low quality gold was considered yellow. Again, a phenomenon of categorization. Furthermore, not all languages have the exact same boundaries within the color spectrum when it comes to nomenclature. Let me prove it to you. Look at these two colors. One is red and one is pink. Would you all agree that these are two different colors? Of course you say. And yet, pink is nothing more than a light red. In fact, the word pink, which originally was the name of a flower, wasn't used in English to distinguish this specific pale tint of red until the 17th century. Now look at these three colors. To English speakers, these are all blue. To an Italian, this is blue. But these have their own names. This is azzurro and this is celeste. In Italian, in fact, if you wanted to convey the idea of the blue sky, you should say cielo azzurro rather than cielo blu. To a Russian, these two lines of the metro station are two distinct colors with their own names. To an English speaker, they're both blue, just like these two flags are both blue. And if we add green to our example, the situation becomes even weirder. Objectively, the distance between navy blue and powder blue is greater than that between blue and green in any chromaticity diagram. And yet in English, green is a different color, but navy blue and powder blue are both blue. Does that mean that you Anglophone speakers cannot see these different colors because you don't categorize them differently from blue? No. 
Let's remember that all color is an illusion generated in a species-specific way. Colors only exist in your mind. No object is innatively green or blue, that's just how you see it as a human. If I take a magnet called a transcranial magnetic stimulator and use it to inhibit area V4 on the right hemisphere of your brain, you will lose all conscious experience of color from your left field of vision. Remove the magnet and all color comes back. Colors need an information processing system to interpret them as color in order for them to exist. Sure, the electromagnetic radiation and its wavelength do exist, but colors are just our way to interpret them. Furthermore, to me, this is subtractively yellow. It absorbs all wavelength of light except for yellow light that then reflects back to my retina. To you instead, since you are seeing this on your screen, this is not subtractively yellow because your screen is not producing yellow light. It can only produce red, green, or blue. The yellow I see and the yellow you see are completely different, and yet they appear the same. Conclusion, it's easy to lie to the brain. This isn't yellow at all. It's the screen telling your brain a lie. You can't help but believe. No language on earth is able to describe accurately the millions of colors the human eye is able to distinguish. If fidelity is what you're looking for, then only numbers have the level of accuracy you want. On a computer screen, we work with the RGB color system, where each pixel has a mix of red, green and blue light. You can then represent nearly 17 million distinct mixtures of RGB light in terms of a six-digit hexadecimal code. Here are 14 different colors. Now, do you prefer D3, D7, 2, 6? Or would you rather buy a shirt in C8, CB28? Given they're very similar, but not exactly the same. I mean, I can be a little pedantic at times, but even I would make a whole debunking video to tell you that the color that the XY YouTuber called EE814B was in fact D56E3C. There is polychrome in ancient wall painting, architecture, clothing, figural painting, pottery utensils and ornaments in ancient. Greece, and that includes blue. I mean, did you look at the Minoans? Blue is in the artwork, on their buildings, on the makeup of their women. Not to mention the fact that it also had funerary connections in their culture. The ancient Egyptians did have a word for blue and did create the so-called Egyptian blue. Egyptian blue was very popular, guess where? In the entire Mediterranean world, because of maritime trade. Egyptian blue had been used in Greece for a very long time as indicated by the Knossos pigments we shall discuss in the next section. Furthermore, production of Egyptian blue spread to Mesopotamia, Persia, Greece and Rome. The Romans built factories to produce the blue pigment they knew as Caeruleum. We have the description of the manufacture of a blue pigment, which is clearly Egyptian blue frit, given by Vitruvius at the beginning of the first century BC in the books of architecture. In addition, there is also the description of the Roman navy in Britannia made by Vegetius, and he tells us that the Romans dyed the tunics of the soldiers in the navy and painted their boats and ships the same color as the ocean blue so that they would be less visible. In other words, blue was a sort of early tactical camouflage for the Romans. Of course, the relationship to color of a person changed depending on the level of development of the material culture. Cavemen didn't have the means to express blue artistically, but that didn't mean that they couldn't see it. And now get ready for the kicker. Not only Egyptian blue was available in Greece, but it wasn't the only blue the Greeks had access to. <laughs> Hey, don't hold it against me if the next section blew your mind. Several cities flourished in Greece during the Bronze Age, in particular the centers of Gnosos, Mycenae, Pylos, Thera, and numerous wall paintings and murals have been uncovered. Samples of blue pigment from excavated wall paintings have been analyzed by non-destructive methods, namely X-ray fluorescence, X-ray diffraction, and mineralogical microscopic examination. It took me 10 takes to say them right, and the results show two types of blue pigment used. Egyptian blue, which confirms the fact that it was imported through trade, and glaucophane, a sodium magnesium or iron aluminium hydroxide silicate, which occurs as a natural mineral in Crete, and Thera. The usage of this glaucophane pigment as a prominent constituent in Minoan art is unquestioned. Now check this out. Question. Thera. Did you notice I put emphasis on it during my explanation? Thera is an ancient Greek city where? Santorini. You'd think the country that is now ubiquitously known for beautiful blue rooftops would have a longer history with the color. No mate. Wrong pick. 
that is precisely the place where they made blue in the Bronze Age in Greece. I gotta say, academic research sometimes does have a sick sense of humor. And besides, in Mycenae, not only they used Egyptian blue, but they modified it, creating variations in blue through grinding the base material with varying amounts of quartz. The Romans tell us of the difference between continental Celts and island Celts, so in Britain. And it's so interesting because the Celtic realities in Britain are kind of frozen in time, in the sense that they still had chariots, even after chariots were abandoned in the continent within the Celtic tradition. They still had Druids, even though the Druids in continental Gaul, they still had them, but the Druids in Britain were considered to be repertoires of ancient knowledge that had gone lost, that was lost in the continent. And so continental Celts from Gaul would go to Britain to study, like a bit of an Erasmus, if you will, or like a... So they, that's mentioned in the sources. When you see Celts that are fighting the Romans and they have painted blue or green, we don't know if they were tattoos or it was actually body paint, but you know what I'm talking about. Those are Britonic. Because even though we do have mentions, and that's what I believe, I've looked into the sources, and I think that the continental Gauls ancestrally did use body paints. There is a coin that shows a continental gold with a little swirl that we see in Britonic context, but they had abandoned it. But they did keep it in, in the island. This often happens. Islands tend to be linguistically and socially more conservative when it comes to the preservation of ancient traditions. Yeah, woad, exactly. The, it's a flowering plant of the uh, family Brassicace. Uh, it's also called glastrum, woad. The Romans call it wheatrum. So he's correct when it comes to Isatis tinctoria woad, as the plant used to make these. We don't know if these, this is actual paint or if they are tattoos. It is possible that it's one or the other, maybe both. They're both likely. Also because the term in Latin that they use when they talk about the act of this, is the same that they use, it can also be translated as dyeing. It's like when you permanently, permanently dye clothing. At that point it's like, but is it, is it tattoos then if it's permanent and it has, because in Latin it can have that. So it's possible that these were tattoos or maybe not, maybe they were acro paints. When it comes to the color that is mentioned in blue, well, let's look at the actual word. So in Latin, this is either described, described in two ways. Both um, Mela and Caesar use the word Caeruleum. Caeruleum can translate as dark blue or the color of the sky and the sea, a variety of blue. There is another author that actually uses the term Virdis, which means green. It's a little bit of a later author. It's Publius Ovidius, uh, but it does say Virdis. So we have two options. It was either blue or it was green, or maybe it was both, or another possibility is that it was a color a little bit in between. You know, when blue and green, like aquamarina, that's another another possibility. We have no idea. The supposed magic body paint armor, yeah. Yeah, they thought they had some magical property, and a lot of it probably was ritualistic, psychological even. They use both terms in Latin, so who knows? <music> In the period, we have a fantastic saying, and I don't get to use this one very often, so it's nice to say it. Julius Caesar says, open quotes, Ipsorum lingua Celtae, nostra galli appellantur. So if we take this Latin sentence, Ipsorum lingua, so lingua means language, Ipsorum, it's like their own. That's, it can be translated or actual is another way to translate. So in the actual language or in their own language, ipsorum lingua Celtae. So in their own language, Celts. And then he says nostra with uh, omitting because it's understood by context language. So nostra meaning in ours, he's saying in ours, Galli, so Gauls, appellantur. We call them or we refer to them or name them. So Julius Kaiser, who had direct contact with Celtic populations because of, that's how he, he writes the De Bello Gallico, so he has this war of invasion, meets the continental Celtic realities, and remember that Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar, went to Britain. He didn't manage to conquer it, you'll have to wait for Claudius, but he did go. So he's an eyewitness to both continental Celts and insular Celts. And he tells us that in, in their language they are Celts, Celtae. He's, 
kind of Latinizing it because he's speaking and writing in Latin, but definitely it's clear that the stem is Celt something, probably just Celt, and then he adds it makes the suffix to create a plural in Latin. So he says in their language it's Celtae, that's how they call themselves, but we call them Gauls, Galli and Gallia with a long a when it comes to phonemic vowel length, when it comes to the to the area. But it's very likely that instead, probably the term Gaul comes from a single tribe, and maybe the Romans extended that to all of them, at least in that area. When it comes to insular Celts, they do distinguish them, the Romans do distinguish them from the continental Celts, but it's important to underline that the Romans do not consider them separate, the ones in England, in Britain, from the ones in Caledonia, so Scotland. There is a difference, of course, between Gallic, Gaelic, Scottish, Britonic, Irish, absolutely, but from the perspective of a Roman, for the way they write, both not only Julius Caesar, which is the famous one, but to mention another one, Pomponius Mela, Roman geographer, they say, no, they're the same, they're all Celts. They do not distinguish, I do not believe it's because of ignorance, I do believe it's because they still weren't distinct enough, culturally, linguistically and religiously, for the Romans to perceive them as different political entities. They will become different political entities, but you've got to wait until the 3rd century AD. If I'm not wrong, I didn't do a deep research for this one, but I'm saying for the Romans there was no difference. In fact, the only difference that the Romans mentioned, this is fascinating, between the Celts of southern Britain and the Celts of Scotland is the color of the of the of the hair. Because they say that the southern Celts of southern England were blonde, but the northern Celts of Scotland tended to be more redhead, and that's it. And that's why, for example, even in, in the Sicilian language, we tend to do things that they did in Latin, but in modern Italian they don't do anymore, such as putting the verb at the end. We tend to do it in, in the emphatic clause. And similarly, likewise, which one is the Nordic country that has a closer connection to Old Norse, Iceland, because it's an island? So islands tend to preserve traditions that then the continent, the continents usually change. And so that's why I think a lot of, of, of these ritualistic aspects of Celtic realities uh, were found and preserved in, in the Britonic context, but they were gone or considered obsolete, like the chariots in war, in continental warfare. And it's fascinating. I have a question for you. Is the sky really blue? Now, clearly, the the waves are the same, but what stops becoming blue and turns into green? Yeah, it varies. Even modern languages. Japanese? Man, I've had a few discussions with the Japanese. Because I was like, they were like, can you pass me the blue cup? And I'm like, there is no blue cup. Like, the one over there. And I'm like, oh, that's green. No, that's blue. Because we were placing that mark in a different section. Which is why the stoplight in Japanese is consistently called blue. While for me, it's green. Yeah, the translator is colorblind. Yeah, that can make things even a bit more complicated, right? Yeah, the stoplight is still red. That's true. <laughs> if you're enjoying this video so far, please take a moment to check out my Patreon page. With as little as a $5 support, you can help us ensure that we can continue to produce high quality and high researched content. And at the same time, you get access to polls, extra videos, unlisted streams, and much more. Thank you so much.